little piece there. Okay, Maya, I am online, so I am broadcasting. Uh, welcome, Emily from Wyoming and Janet from Idaho. We have someone from Florida and North Carolina. Welcome, friends. We are so excited to see you. Thank you for joining us today for day five of the Virtual Excel Academy. We're really excited to be here with you today, friends. And we are here with Jeff Kilbrew today. There were a few things we asked you to get today, so hopefully you are ready with a box. I have my box here and it has a lid so I can put things inside it and I won't know what it is. I also have a few household objects. So I'm just gonna share what I brought. I have a hairbrush, a little tiny hairbrush with a mirror on one side and some rainbow colored spikes. And I have a hair tie and I have a ball and my favorite household object, although I don't know if this qualifies, anybody want to guess what this might be? That is my friend, my talking Elsa doll. I hope to see some of the things that some of our friends at home brought today. But before I share any more, I have two little tips to share with you. First of all, we have a bunch of online tips on our website. So if you are having any technical difficulties, you may either chat with us in the chat window or you may go online to Paths to Literacy to pull down those tips. Secondly, we do have a poll. We just wanna know who is joining us. And I see my friends at home are writing to me. That was Elsa from Frozen. You are so right. I'm so glad you know who we have here joining us in my house, Elsa. And uh, thank you for answering the poll. All right, and I'm gonna introduce Jeff. He is joining us today for a very special lesson, What's in My Box? Thank you, Jeff. Oh, hi, thank you. Hi, everybody, I'm excited to be here. Um, uh, it's a little bit new to me, so hopefully this will work out pretty good. Uh, as you know, my name is Jeff Killebrew, and let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm the uh, science teacher at the New Mexico School for the Blind and Visually Impaired and we're located in Alamogordo, New Mexico. So if you don't know where Alamogordo is at, I encourage you to uh, check it out, do a little research. Uh, a lot of us have some extra time on our hands these days. Uh, we just found out about an hour ago that the uh, schools here in New Mexico are going to be closed for the entire rest of the school year. So um, a, lot of, a lot of opportunities to do some cool research from home. Um, one of the neat things about where we live here in Alamogordo is we have the most unique beach in the entire world. It's not made of sand though. It's something that is white. So that's all I'm going to tell you so that you can do a little research to find out what this stuff is that's, oh, about 20 miles that way from where I'm sitting right now. It's pretty cool stuff. Well, today I want to hopefully show you a, a interesting and a fun activity that's related to science that anybody can do anytime and any place. You can do it with your family, with friends. I know that we're all kind of trying to stay apart from each other, but in your households, uh, moms and dads, brothers and sisters, grandparents, any of your caregivers, uh, anybody can do this. And uh, it, it really is a neat interesting and challenging activity. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. First, what I want to talk about is how this relates to science and the nature of science. Uh, in science, we gather information in order to learn about the world. And we gather the information through our senses, our sense of touch, taste, smell, sight, and hearing. Now, a lot of us in uh, who are probably joining us today either don't have very good sight or some probably don't have any at all so the other senses kind of take over but we get we use our senses to gather all of this information that uh, uh, is around us and we either gather it directly by actually 
physically grabbing a hold of something, uh, feeling it, smelling it, tasting it, uh, listening to it, or sometimes we either we, we get engaged in what's called indirect observation. We have to do that with with uh, phenomenon or objects that we can't access easily. We can't really grab a hold of them. Uh, and we'll talk more about those types of uh, uh, observations here in just a few minutes. What we do with all of those observations then is we kind of gather them together, we think through them, and then we, we infer or we make inferences about uh, what it is that we're, we're studying or that we're, we're um, learning about. And an inference is nothing more than some conclusion or conclusions that we reach that are based on the evidence that we've gathered and the reasoning or what we've thought about what it is. Also, science is a collaborative effort. That means people work together. You don't just do this by yourself and figure things out by yourself. Scientists will work with other scientists in the uh, university that they work at or in the laboratories that they're working at, uh, or they will also collaborate much like what we're doing today uh, across the world, either with colleagues in other countries or other parts of the country, or other universities or other laboratories uh, that they're working with. What this collaboration does is it allows people to kind of bounce ideas off each each other, uh, share the information, share the observations that have been and their interpretations or their on it. Ask, what do you think? Well, makes sense. I think you're on the right track. Or wait, you know, I don't think that makes much sense at all. I think we need to go down a different path. And so that's this idea of collaboration. We engage in science every day. You engage in science every day. You may not know if that's the title of, I'm a scientist and I didn't even know it. We do this every day. You do this every day by using your senses to gather information wherever you're at and wherever you go. Uh, we're constantly doing that. And we're then using that information that we gather through our senses to infer and reach conclusions. A couple of examples of that is when you walk outside, okay? We walk outside. If I were to walk outside where I'm at today, uh, whatever hair is left on my head would get blown all over the place because it's very windy out. So I could infer, ooh, it probably would not be a good day for me to barbecue outside because those embers could get loose. Or I could infer because it's overcast and windy that it feels like maybe a storm is coming. Maybe you are waking up in the morning and you smell something coming from the kitchen. Maybe some bacon cooking and you get interested. You infer then, oh, mom's cooking bacon. I got breakfast waiting for me. I'm going to head down, uh, down and go get it. Sometimes we infer when we uh, open up the, the refrigerator, we smell something bad in there. It's like, oh, something's gone bad. Let me check it out and uh, find out what food has gone bad. And probably the, the most frequent or the funnest time when you're a scientist when you don't know is on Christmas morning. When you have your, your presents under the tree, you grab your present, you shake it around, you listen, you're trying to figure out what is inside of that gift before you actually find out what's in there. You're listening to sounds, you're feeling what, what, how much it weighs, uh, things like that. And we're going to use those same skills in this activity that I'm going to show you here in just a little bit. So all that means is that you are a scientist every single day. The only difference between us or you as students and uh, scientists who get paid to be scientists is that scientists will formally record their observations, and then systematically study them over a period of time, making more observations, refining what 
their, their finding, refining their ideas about these observations and their inferences, uh, not only by themselves, and then, but also through that collaboration that we talked about, and then they're further studying it. So one of the things that we, we have to deal with is, you know, it's easy to, to get information, to infer information about objects that you can touch and grab a hold of. But how do we gain information and scientific knowledge about the things that we either cannot see or feel? And that's where a lot of technology comes into the science field. I mean, we have that big STEM word, S-T-E-M, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, so technology helps scientists then to be able to, to gather information from places that are inaccessible to us, okay? Uh, scientists will build specialized sensors and, tech, and engineers will build sensors uh, and those sensors then will either use common materials or they'll be very, very specialized to make observations so that the scientists can gather information about what it is that they're needing to, to uh, they're, they're wanting to study. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. One example is how we know about the structure of what's below our feet, feet the Earth's interior. Uh, over the years, uh, mostly within the last 50 years, we've gotten a, a be much better understanding of what lies underneath uh, the surface of the earth that we live on. We know that there's a crust, it's a very thin layer of the earth, and below there is the mantle, and we've kind of uh, found out that there's two layers of the mantle, the asthenosphere and the lithosphere, and then as we get closer to the center of the earth, we have that outer core, which seems to be made of liquid nickel and iron, and then a solid inner core of made also of, of, of nickel and iron. How do we know these things? No one has ever been able to go down to those depths of the earth. As much as uh, uh, people have tried, the farthest we've been able to drill into, into the earth has just been a few miles. We really haven't gotten too far into it. So the main way in which scientists understand places like the interior of the earth is by studying things that happen to the crust of the earth. And as the, uh, the energy then moves through the internal structure of the earth, uh, structures of the earth, they're able to find out and, and understand and infer the, 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 what the earth is made out of. So I'm talking mainly about earthquakes here, okay? And an interesting thing that happened here yesterday, about 200 miles from us, there was about a 5.0 earthquake. Uh, a lot of folks in the area felt it, I didn't. But that earthquake also helped scientists gain a better understanding of what the Earth's structure is like. And here's how that happens. All across the globe, there are seismic stations with seismographs uh, in the ground measuring movement of the Earth along Earth's faults and in the middle of the faults or the, the, the plates, okay? And there are, whenever the earth moves, whenever there's a, a plate movement, the uh, energy is released and scientists have measured and found that uh, there's a few different types of seismic waves that get released as a result of it. They're S waves and P waves are the two that travel through the earth. One travels faster than the other depending on the density of the material that they're going through. And so then the, as the seismic waves get, uh, get started in one part of the earth and get measured in a different part of the earth, scientists then can better understand the makeup of that internal structure of the earth through those seismographs. The information gets studied, it gets interpreted, and every time that there is movement within the earth's crust, these seismic waves 
go out through the Earth's interior and give scientists a better and better picture of what's happening. Now, unfortunately, sometimes those earthquakes get to be a little bit too strong and it causes a lot of problems uh, for, for folks on the surface of the Earth. Um, and those are, are unfortunate situations, especially for our, our, the, their friends out there in Southern California who live along that San Andreas fault line. But nonetheless, all of that information helps, gives us a better understanding of the overall structure of the earth. And then we can interpolate or, or extract that out to what we think is happening on other planets like Mars or some of the moons of other planets like uh, Io and Europa uh, that are out there. Let me give you one other example of, uh, uh, of how we gain understanding of things that we're not able to grab a hold of or, or access very easily. And that's in astronomy. Um, you know, as, as humans have ex explored the universe, we've only sent people to the moon and only 12 people have walked on the moon. And it's been quite a long time since that has happened. As far as studying the sun or any of the other planets, we can't get there. We know we've sent some uh, robotic air, uh, instruments and, and uh, uh, the landers to Mars and to some other planets. But even then, that's a very specialized sensor that has been developed by a team of scientists sent to this place to gather information so that, and then that information gets sent back to the scientists and then allows them to gain information about what is going on on those uh, planets or, or moons. And then they can, knowing what happens on our planet here, Earth, they can infer what's going on in those planets. Uh, we use telescopes. Uh, we use things called spectroscopes that looks at the different light structures and, and the, the frequencies of light. But also among what's called the, the electromagnetic spectrum, there's more than just what is there that our uh, human eyes can see, the visible part of it. There's x-rays, and so scientists build uh, sensors that can detect x-rays, ultraviolet rays or radiation, and infrared sensors. Now, I know something a little bit about the infrared sensors because a few years ago, I had the privilege to be able to be uh, uh, participate in a very special uh, group of people called the uh, SOFIA group. And this is a NASA organization, or part of NASA, and it's S-O-F-I-A. That's the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. It's a, what NASA did is they took a 747 jumbo jet they cut a hole in the back end of it and put a 100 inch diameter telescope in the back and it flies at night and all that instrument does is study infrared astronomy, it looks at a very specific wavelength or several different types of wavelengths so that the uh, astronomers then can see uh, parts of the universe that we would not normally be able to see with our eyes. And so uh, when I flew on Sophia, we flew uh, toward the Arctic Circle and we were looking at star forming regions in the constellation Sagittarius, which happens to be at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. So- um, Hey Jeff, yeah. can I ask you to please keep your hands down because oh. it's making your camera readjust every Oh, I time. will do that, I am so sorry. I will try my hardest to do that. Is there anybody else that has any questions before we, we move on? Anything else I could can answer? How, I'm not sure how that works. It's in the chat. Uh, there is a bubble at the bottom that you can click to open the chat if you would like to see what they are writing. A lot of people are saying, I love science. Oh, okay. And uh, one person wanted to to touch the hot, li I, hot I, liquid. I, <laughs> uh, so... And that's what you've got so far. If you want to talk to you participants or have them respond to you, we will help them. And you have uh, Rose who does have a question. Okay. And then 
we have another person who has asked, what does ultraviolet mean? Okay. Well, let me a answer about ultraviolet. In the electromagnetic spectrum, there is, uh, it, it's, it's a measurement of the different energies that uh, at least we know about that exist in the universe. Starts out with low energy, which is radio waves. It moves into then um, the uh, visible part of the spectrum, which light is made up of, of waves of photons. And we have the uh, red, orange, yellows, green, blues, then indigos and violets. And then uh, on either side of that visible spectrum, uh, when you, just before the red, that's called infrared. It's a very low energy, kind of a cool radiation. And then just beyond the violet part is what's called the ultraviolet, which is higher energy uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation. And uh, sometimes we, 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 find, we hear that we need to kind of be careful when we're outside, you know, use sunscreen to protect ourselves from those ultraviolet or the UV rays because they're higher energy than the visible part of the spectrum and um, they're more damaging to our skin, to our cells. And when you move past the ultraviolet, then you get into the microwaves and then into x-rays and gamma rays. And those, uh, as, as the energy increases in those waves, uh, it becomes more damaging to us as, as people, as organic uh, creatures. Uh, is there any other questions I could answer before we get into the activity? I think you have many people ready to get into the activity. They're all asking right. what to do. All right. So I wanted to say all those things to kind of give you an idea about what, what this is going to be. Like I said, it, it can be an activity that can be done with anybody, anytime. And uh, it'd be kind of fun, you know, if you make a box and then, of course, you have to know what's in the box. And then you can challenge your family and friends to this, okay? Um, one of the things I wanted to say is these, they're called mystery boxes. They can be customized to uh, any interest or subject that uh, folks want to learn about. You just have to be creative and, and uh, set them up that way. So mystery box. What is a mystery box? Well, basically it's a box that you don't know what's inside of it. You have to use your senses to figure out or determine what the contents of that box is. Also, what you could do, you could, be, you could be a little bit more involved and then try to determine what the structure of the interior of that box is like. Now, hopefully my camera won't drive things too crazy, but I wanna kind of show you here. I've got a, a box, let me back up here a little bit. And right now my box is empty. So we can start out very simply by just putting one item into the box. Now, I would recommend that you use something that's round and probably hard to start out with. I've got a marble here, okay? So I'm gonna just put my marble in the box and close the box. Now, if you're doing this with your family and friends, you'll probably wanna then take the, the box closed so that nobody can, can get to the inside. You wanna keep what's inside secret, okay? Obviously, you know that if you move this box around, not sure if you can hear it, but I can listen to and I can hear that there's something moving inside the box. Now, if I didn't know what that, what, what that was, then I could have to, would have to figure out what it is. And I can move it around the four sides, I can kind of try to get toward the middle there, okay? And I can kind of figure out that there's nothing blocking my marble that's in the box. It can move freely. Now I can listen to it. I can feel with my hands what the vibrations feel like as the marble moves throughout the box. Uh, I could put my ear up close to it. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, the start of, of making these mystery boxes, a very simple one. I'll show you and we'll talk about examples of some more complicated ones as we go along. But basically what you're going to do is you're going to either put 
one object or several objects into the box. You can uh, make dividers in the box. You could have uh, partitions that section off different parts of the box. You could put ramps inside the box, tunnels inside the box. Uh, just make sure that no insects or animals go in the box. We don't want any living creatures to be inside of here, okay? Um, so yeah, so this is, this is kind of the basics of how we started out, just with one marble or one ball that rolls in the box, and then uh, you can give that to your family or your friends and ask them, what do you think is in this box? Use your senses to kind of determine that. Let me get a couple of other things here. I've got, I think a lot of you have uh, gathered some items and any of those items will work well. Um, you know, we've got some cardboard tubes that you can use for inside the box, uh, balls, uh, thimbles, spools. Oh, I'm sorry, my camera keeps focusing. I'm not sure how to get that to stop. Uh, whatever you if you have, move well, slower, it does help. A little, little slower, okay. I've got ping pong balls. Of course, those are going to sound different than uh, other balls. Marbles will sound different. Uh, steel balls will sound different, and you can use those then to to uh, on a variety of ways. Uh, we've got you know, balloons, you could put balloons inside the box, really whatever your imagination will, uh, can think of is okay to put inside the box, like I said, except for animals or insects. So I have a question for your students out there. What is the first thing they put in their box? They can put it in the oh. chat box and tell us. There you go. And another thing, Jeff, is we have uh, somebody saying that you could also guess the mass of the object. Oh, you guys are already thinking ahead of me. I haven't yeah. even gotten there yet. So that shows that you're good. You're, you're thinking well scientifically because you're already thinking of different ways in which you can use your senses to figure out what's inside of your mystery box. That's excellent. I'm going to read some of the answers in the chat box of what people have put in. Okay. Well, Golf ball, light bulb, marble, stuffed bear, grail ruler, pen, scissors, rubber band, and some paper, candy, uh, nuts, new Uno cards, baby wipes, a marble, a roll of tape, wiki sticks, an apple. That's what we've got so far. Yeah, and all of those are great things. Now, the apple could be interesting because if you leave it in there for a while, not only then would you be able to use your sense of, of touch and listening, but if you leave it in long enough, you'll be able to use your sense of smell. And if you know what a rotten apple smells like, then you'll be able to figure out what's in that box. <laughs> Let me give you another example here of uh, something else that, that I've, I've made. I've got a, uh, a box here that uh, some dishwasher tablets came in. And so it's a plastic box. We don't necessarily need to use a cardboard box, but we can get different uh, sensory feedback by using different boxes. The key is, is the boxes have to be opaque. That means you can't see into them and they have to be able to be covered. Now I've got just one ball in here, okay? And I can roll it around but if I roll it around a certain way in here, see, I've, what I've done, let me get this top off, is I have, those who are able to see, I have taken a, a cardboard tube and kind of cut it in half and taped it to the bottom, which then now I'm starting to make things a little bit more complex, a little bit more uh, difficult to figure out the structure of the inside of the box. So I've got a tube there where my little metal ball will roll around 
but now it won't roll around all 360 degrees. Once it gets stuck inside of that cardboard tube, it won't roll anymore. And then I have to kind of figure out, ooh, something's in there that's preventing this ball from moving. Now, put the lid back on here. So we can move this around and now the ball is inside that tube and it's no longer moving. Instead of just relying completely on my sense of touch or, or, or uh, hearing, I'm gonna use an instrument to help me out. I've got some magnets here, okay? So I know that the ball I have, I have in here is, mag, is, is metal so that if I can get the ball toward the corner here, oh, now my magnet sticks to it. And this allows me then now to get a little bit better understanding that ooh, whatever is inside of this box must be some sort of magnetic material, maybe made of iron or steel because this thing sticks and it's magnetic. Now, if you have access to a like stainless steel ball, then it won't, the magnets won't necessarily stick to some of those. So that could be interesting as well. Of course, if you have a rubber ball or like a marble, then the magnet's going to give you information that, that tells you that whatever's in there is non-magnetic. So as you move through and work with your mystery boxes, uh, your, the people that you're going to share these with will need to kind of develop a, and think about different ways in which they, they can uh, better, gain a better understanding of what's happening inside the box. So first box, real simple, just one marble or one ball um, in there and then uh, you know, kind of get the idea. We can start to uh, get more complicated uh, by adding internal structures to the box. As we add internal structures, you probably want to keep uh, maybe one rolling item uh, that's constant in there because it's hard to figure out what that item is made out of unless you get really advanced. And then the focus is, is then falls on what the actual structure of the inside of the box is like. You put this one down. Now, this next example, I think you said someone was already kind of asking or thinking that they could find out the mass of whatever is inside the box. And that's exactly what I want to show you now. I have a, another box that has uh, some objects in it. So what you can do for that is just get another identical box, you could either with your own senses, with your, your sense of touch, feel the empty box and then compare that to the box that has the items in it. Or if you have a scale available, go ahead and, and then weigh the scale, weigh, weigh the box on the scale. And then that way then you can weigh the box has items on it, in it, and find out that, hey, there is some weight to them. That way then you know that the mass or the weight is, is a certain amount. Now, I use those two terms there, mass and weight. For those of you who don't know, weight is a measurement of the gravitational pull on an object. Uh, so when you get on a scale and, and, and get your weight, you're weighing, you're actually measuring the, the Earth's pull on you. And mass is a measurement of how much matter or how much stuff is inside the object, okay? In the United States, we measure weight in usually pounds and ounces. As far as mass goes, uh, the standard is grams and kilograms. So we can do that with this box. We can now know that yeah, it has a certain amount of, of weight or mass to whatever's inside of there because I'm comparing it to the empty one. So that gives me information that my, uh, th that wouldn't normally uh, be evident just by looking or feeling at the box. Uh, we can roll this around. 
Not sure if you can hear there, but I've got a couple of things inside of here. This one is, is more complicated and more complex, okay? So let me tell you what I have in this box. I have a balloon taped to one end of the box, okay? And I have an empty peanut butter jar with two marbles enclosed inside the peanut butter jar. And that peanut butter jar is free to roll in the box. The marbles make all sorts of interesting sounds and noise with the plastic. Uh, they're able to move freely. So then now the uh, inertia or the movement of the peanut butter jar uh, kind of makes the box out of balance as you're exploring it. But then also when you're when you're moving it and it runs into the end where the, the uh, balloon is at, you feel it kind of be a cushion. So we're getting more complicated, more complex. So as you get used to working with these mystery boxes uh, and, and you're, you, you're, you're ready for greater challenge with them, then uh, you can make them quite complicated. Okay. Jeff, we have a question for you before you go any further. Could sure. you tell us whether or not it's important to have a lid on the box, please? Yes, it is. The, the boxes have to be, uh, like I, I mentioned, they have to be, get my hands down. They have <laughs> to be opaque, which means you can't, you, know, you should not be able to see into the boxes. And they have to have a cover. And when you're ready to uh, challenge someone or if someone is making the box for you to figure out what's in there, the boxes have to be completely covered and sealed. Because the idea is, is you don't want to be able to, to see or feel or, or know what's in that box until you've actually had a chance to, to make some observations and then kind of make some, some educated guesses based on the information that you're, you're gathering. So yes, the boxes do need to have a, a lid and they do need to be, uh, everything inside's gotta be contained so that the person who's exploring them should not be able to see them. Thank you, we have a couple more quick questions. Does it matter if the box is circle shaped? You know, I, I don't think so. If the box is circle shaped, that certainly is gonna give a little bit more, uh, make it more challenging because there won't be corners that whatever is inside there can't be, I guess, trapped in. But no, anything's, anything's legal. Just be as creative as you want to. But understand, though, that if you're going to provide or make a box for a family member or a friend, uh, that uh, if they're not quite used to it, you probably don't want to make it too challenging to start with. Kind of get it, ease into the activity. But then as you progress through it, you can make the... Uh, the box is more challenging and then you can use those round boxes um, and certainly yeah, it'd be, be a lot more difficult. Uh, you'd have to really think through and, 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 and figure out some different ways to be able to determine what's inside that box. But yeah, no, good question. And one more question before we let you go on. What would you hope that your student would be able to infer from the new box with the balloon and the marble jar? With that, we're looking at getting an, an understanding of the, of the structure of, what, of the inside of the box. What makes up that box, okay? We know the box is a rectangle, okay? But what is inside there? What did that person uh, put inside there? And, and it, how is it arranged? So that really uh, relates very well to how scientists uh, are able to understand the structure, the internal structure of the earth, because we can't see what's inside the earth. But like I mentioned with those seismic waves traveling through the earth, we're able to get a better understanding of the different layers and, and kind of what they're made out of. And so with that balloon, uh, you know, maybe some folks are, are not familiar with the balloon, uh, but they'll able to feel a cushion effect as that uh, peanut butter jar moves around inside there. And again, these are just some, some examples. Uh, you're gonna develop uh, uh, some boxes that are 
way better than what I can think of because I know you all are extremely creative and talented young scientists out there. And so uh, just understanding, you know, like I said, those structures and uh, hopefully they won't be impossible to figure out, but, but, you know, you can make mazes inside of the box and try to figure out the structure of, of those mazes. Uh, really the sky's the limit, but, but it does help us better understand then how science works and we're having fun while we're doing this and there's nothing wrong with having fun and, and messing around with each other while we, while we do uh, engage in learning. And I told you it was the last question, but we have a question from Rose. How many items can you put in the box? Uh, how many items you want to fit inside the box? You know, the more items that there are, the more confusing uh, that it could possibly be. So again, it depends on, on uh, the, the person that you're challenging uh, and, uh, or the group of people that you're challenging. If you're doing this as a uh, part of a, a, a group of friends or, or as a school um, project, you certainly could put uh, several different types of items in there and uh, possibly contain them in different sections of the box you know, or just have them all rattling around in there free, uh, uh, banging into each other, and then trying to, to find out or figure out what those items are, what they're made out of, because you have to then infer that information using uh, knowledge that you already have. So yeah, no, it, it, uh, the sky's the limit. Uh, I probably wouldn't put too many things in, you know, like, like I probably wouldn't put 10 or 15 things in, but uh, maybe four or five, once a person gets really used to it, I think is reasonable. Thank you. And is there anything about how big the box needs to be? Oh, uh, that's another good question. Uh, a lot of times, and, and I'll, I, I do this with my students, so every couple of years or so, uh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll have small, maybe jewelry boxes with a, maybe one item in it, uh, cereal boxes, pop tart boxes, things like that. Um, and I'll limit it because, uh, and I'll make several boxes that are identical, maybe four or five identical boxes. If I have a class that has a few students in them and then, uh, they all get the same box uh, with the same structure inside with the same material inside. They're able to manipulate it. Uh, you can really use any size box that you want to. You can make, uh, like I said, make several of them that are exactly the same, or you can have several different types of boxes that challenge different senses. Uh, the key is, is, is for the, 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 the person who is, that you're challenging to, uh, or if you're being challenged, you don't want a box so large that you can't lift it up shake it around, move it. So um, like a big refrigerator box probably uh, wouldn't be the best choice, but certainly is not impossible. You certainly could do that. Thanks, I think that's it for now. So keep going. We don't wanna okay. ask, use all your time. Oh no, no, we're fine. So as we've talked about, the, um, we can get very complicated with the boxes. And so this last box I call my extreme box. And I would not start out with this box because this is very challenging. I've got a couple of different items in here. And I'm, I'll try to move slowly so my camera doesn't, uh, doesn't mess things up. Um, but inside this box, I've got several different types of material and a couple of different round objects that will make a different sounds as they uh, collide with those different materials. And let me kind of just tell you what I've got inside of this box. I'll kind of show you. I start out with one large marble and I also have a ping pong ball. Now the internal structure of the box, see if I can get those balls to hold still there. The internal structure of the box is very interesting. For those of you who are able to see, hopefully you can, 
I've got a wooden panel that sections off one part of the box. And then I also have a uh, kind of like a paint can, a small uh, pint paint can with items inside of that. So it's rattling around making a different sound. And at the bottom of the box, let me turn this here. I'm sorry for my camera. I have an aluminum loaf pan that I've got taped to the bottom of the box. And actually inside of there, I've got a large rubber ball. So the ping pong ball, I'll put in the small section, the sectioned off by the wooden panel. And the marble, I'll have in a large section so that it can crash into the paint can and the aluminum can. And then it allows whoever is going to be exploring this box, you know, we can find out with a magnet, anything that's magnetic in here. Oh, there's that paint can, it's sticking there, okay. But over here by the aluminum pan, it's not, but I know there's something over on that end. The balls are moving around. It's very complicated, so you have to really sort out what you're, you're, you're listening to, what you're feeling, uh, what information is, is being provided to you from these types of boxes. This, again, that, that's my extreme box. And uh, those would be more, I guess, with advanced users for this, but certainly, certainly very challenging and very fun activity to do with that. Um, the neat thing about these is really, it does not depend on visual senses. Uh, let me move back up here a little bit, see if I can get my camera to stop focusing. There we go, sorry about that. So we use our non-visual senses to gather information for all of these, which is very important for, for uh, many of us. Uh, we can listen, like I said, we feel, uh, weighing them, getting the mass of the objects, using magnets, but really any other types of information gathering uh, observations that you can make would be uh, a really cool thing to do. Now, what, I what we do in, in my classes when I do this with my students is uh, I ask them to record their observations and that's a very important thing to do write down what you're noticing. It doesn't have to be very formal. It doesn't have to be very detailed. It can be just a real quick uh, note, uh, heard this, felt that, you know, things like that. But, but it's important to write them down when you're working with an unknown box. The reason why is, is if you're working with several other of your friends doing these, then you can compare notes with each other and say, well, I, I, I heard this thing run into something metallic in there. And, this, and that thing that was metallic was, was, um, um, meta was magnetic because I could stick a magnet to the outside of that box. Maybe one of your colleagues, your friends was like, well, I didn't notice that. Then you go back and you work on it. That's where all that collaboration works on works together. So you're sharing your information about these mystery boxes with one another. You can go back then and make additional observations. Uh, you can either then keep what your original conclusions were, or you can refine your, 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 your conclusions. You can defend yourself as well. Practice defending yourself. Why do you think the inside is a the way that you think it is, or why do you think that object in the box is the way it is? Defend yourself on that. Well, I think it's a metal ball because, and then list out your reasons for that. All those are important factors uh, in the world of science and, and in being a scientist. Once you've got all that done and that, and you, you either yourself or your group of friends or family then thinks you, they, you know what's in there, then go ahead and open up the boxes. And then you'll either find out that, yeah, your uh, observation, your conclusions are confirmed or that you're not, you're off. And that's the fun part of it. And so 
that's the activity that, that I wanted to share and I wanted, and I gave you a little bit of the science background for it. I hope it's something that you all uh, can, you, can, can, can use and play with and explore uh, during these next several weeks that a lot of us are off of school and, uh, and challenge one another. And uh, I, I hope that uh, I can hear back from some of you as to how uh, maybe you've used these and what kind of things you've done and how fun it was. Hopefully it's a fun activity. I, I, we try to have fun and I like to do things that are fun. Uh, not only that we learn certain things, but we got to have fun with them. So that's Thank what you. I wanted to share. We love that. We have another question since we have a couple more minutes. Um, sure. if, you're, if you're willing to answer some questions. Um, one person, Alicia, would like to know what happens if you use soft things? Go find out. That's a good answer. If anybody else has other questions for Mr. Killebrew, this would be a good time to put them in the chat box. Yeah. We have a couple more minutes. And do you think it's more fun to be the person making the box or guessing what's in the box? Oh, that's kind of like asking who's your favorite child. I mean, both of them, <laughs> <laughs> both of them are really cool. I, I, I'll tell you what, making them is pretty tough. Because uh, when you're putting them together, you're thinking, well, I can do this, or I want to put this there, or, well, wait a minute, I'm going to change it. it, it it's challenging either way. So I, I, for me, I think both of them are fun. Uh, oh, one thing I forgot to mention is when you do make one of these mystery boxes and to, to challenge your family or friends, make sure that you remember what's inside your box and make, and make sure you remember like if, if you make some internal structures, make sure you know what those are because sometimes we forget and then we'll, if, if somebody's guessing correctly or inferring correctly, then uh, we say, oh no, that's not right. But then we open up the box like, oh yeah, I forgot that I put that in there. Yeah, you're right. So it would help be helpful for you to record, uh, write down uh, what you did inside the boxes, seal them up, and then go challenge folks. Uh, can you decorate your box? Yeah, you sure can. There's, there's, there's no rule that said you can't. Uh, I think we have one of your students on here, Mr. K. Gabby uh, keeps writing that he's that she's enjoying this. So. Hi, Gabby. <laughs> Hi, Gabby. <laughs> Uh, another question, I think you've answered this, but we'll, we'll ask you again. Does the object have to be round? It does not have to be round. I've got, uh, I didn't do this, but I've got a little toy, like a little matchbox car that could go in there. Of course, it's got round wheels on it. Uh, you could put uh, a rock in there. Rocks are not necessarily round. Uh, yeah, really the only thing that limits what goes in the box is your imagination. And then again, no animals or insects, nothing alive or nothing living goes inside the box. We don't want uh, any of those critters to be hurt. We have a few more questions. Uh, could you tell us what, what you mean when you say internal structure? Right, so what the inside of the box looks like. The structures are things that may, you may put inside of there. You know, the, the first box that I, that, I, that I talked about, all I did was it was an empty box and then I just put a marble inside so the marble rolls around. But you could insert um, a, a balloon like I did in one or some dividers, uh, cut up some cardboard and make little walls, some sort of little maze maybe inside of there. Uh, maybe you have something metallic that you tape or glue down to one part of it that uh, uh, your objects crash into. Uh, so finding out what's inside of the box, that's the internal structure. Anything that you put in there that uh, is in addition to the empty inside of the box. Thank you. We have a couple of related questions here. Um, can I make a box that doesn't rely on hearing and is quiet? And the related question is why does sound help with information? You know, those are excellent questions, and uh, you certainly could make a box that uh, is silent. You'd have to then try to infer what's in there with some other senses or other measuring techniques, which would be very challenging. Uh, what our sense of hearing does or sound does is we can uh, 
listen to what's happening inside the box, either by holding the box a little bit of ways away from us or right up next to our ears. I even have a student who has her own stethoscope. And so if you have one of those available, you can use one of those on the box and listen to what's going inside. So uh, yeah, the more senses that are used to gather information, the more helpful they are, but certainly you can gather information by just using one or two senses. You don't have to rely on just one, like a lot of us uh, are, don't have the sense of vision or very good vision. So our other senses then learn to take over and that's all part of science too. Could you put a jar with liquid or spice inside of the jar? Ooh, that'd be interesting. I've never thought of that. See, I told you guys, you're thinking of things way <laughs> cooler than I could ever think of. The only thing that I would, I would caution you to is if you put some sort of a liquid in there is make sure that that container is sealed very, very well because dur during the process of exploring, you know, they'll probably be, the box will be shaken um, and move from one side to the other. So you don't want that, that internal uh, container to open up and then you have the liquid spill out. So, but I've had one where I put a peanut butter and jelly sandwich inside of one before. <laughs> Uh, is there a specific material that works better with your box? Again, go find out. That's all that that's that's the wonderful process about science. Go find out. Uh, some may work better for some things, some may not, but you'll never know unless you go explore it. Well, I have to tell you, we have had so many great questions coming into the chat box today, Mr. Killebrew. You've really gotten people thinking. I think we got a lot of scientists who've been with us today. Well, I'm glad. I, I was hoping this would be a fun activity to share with everyone. I, and, and I enjoy doing it with my students, and uh, I think I'll use it again next year. Yeah, great. This is Leanne. I would like to thank you very much for being a part of our event. And it, we found it really fascinating to listen to all the different things that you put in your box and the creative things the students were coming up with. Yeah, it was my pleasure. I, I hope you guys have fun with it and, and do some cool things with your mystery boxes and see if you can fool your parents or your friends. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. A round of applause for being with us today. Those of you at home, please do check out week two of our <coughs> schedule posted on Paths to Literacy. And on Monday, we will have Robin back again to talk about self-awareness. So we hope you all have a wonderful weekend. It's Friday, yay! <laughs> and have a wonderful weekend. We hope to see you Monday. Bye Thank for you, now. everyone. Bye. Bye. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff.